Ik open de zitting van de commissie ter beoordeling van het proefschrift en de stellingen van Daniel Theobald Jooslin. Master in Architecture. I would request the promovendus and the panels to take their position behind and in front of the lectern. Ladies and gentlemen, you may have already noticed that after my first sentence in Dutch, I switched into English. The whole ceremony will be held in English. We very much appreciate it to welcome uh, committee members from outside the TU Delft to take part in the opposition. Actually, we have two members from outside the TU Delft, but one is missing. He is on his way from Japan to the Netherlands and maybe he is still underway. Uh, but we are happy to welcome Professor Bro from the University of Copenhagen. He is sitting closest to the audience. Welcome. Um, then we have a Professor Nijse from the faculty, uh, from the TU Delft, from the Faculty of Architecture and also connected to the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences. The other members are all from the Faculty of Architecture, Professor Meyer, the opposite side, and on this side of the table on my very left, the co-promoter, Dr. Lee, and both promoters, Professor Riedijk on my uh, left and Professor Simons on my right hand. I'm Professor Van Breugel, I'm from the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences, and it is my pleasure and honor to chair this session on behalf of the Rector. I would now like to open the opposition and give the floor to the first opponent, Professor Bro. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for uh, having the opportunity to uh, read your substantive work. We got this book just when entering uh, the meeting, the pre-meeting this morning, and um, we had it in um, in uh, in a digital version until then. And I must uh, applaud you for uh, the number of uh, images. It's really nice to see that we have a dissertation within our field that sort of encompasses both substantial visual work and the analysis that goes with what you have been doing and and then all the reflection and bringing the theory and sort of that sort of uh, horizon for uh, for reflection um, <clears throat> it's been i mean it's it's an ongoing endeavor within landscape architecture architecture design disciplines to uh, bring the methodologies that we bring with those profession into play when we start doing uh, research. And this is definitely an example of how uh, that uh, can be done. So I want to um, congratulate you on, on the work. Um, it's also a very interesting uh, topic, especially uh, for a person like me. I have a background trained as an architect and have went in gone into architecture, uh, into landscape architecture and urbanism and, and uh, the whole heritage questions that goes with what is already there um, later on in, in, in my career. So I, I, I share your, your interest for how those exchanges uh, may occur. Um, I have prepared uh, three questions for you. Um, I'm not sure whether we will get into the third one, but hopefully at least the first and the second. Um, my first question goes with periodization um, in the way that you have sort of structured your uh, initial uh, set of analysis that you sort of uh, sort of pave the ground for uh, for the, your further in examinations into the cases and um, and I want to um, question you a little bit about how those uh, frameworks uh, relate to one another because the cases are current day examples. They derive from the 90s um, where we start to see a major shift in within architecture in terms of um, a new uh, way of performance, a new way of, uh, of uh, spatial expressions and so on. And, and that was what had caught your attention. And <clears throat> the, 
but the, the, the sort of some of the core questions that you also sort of uh, address uh, occasionally throughout the throughout the dissertation also goes with what is actually at stake, um, and and this is where I start to get curious because. <clears throat> One could say that the formation or the foundation of architectural theory dates back to early Renaissance. Um, and this is where we see the development and institutionalization of the system of representations. Um, and I don't think you can uh, overestimate um, this, the, uh, the role of those representations uh, and their significance. And and that actually happens with um, Raphael <clears throat> sort of uh, outlining the relationship between plan and uh, and internal and external sections. And in, he writes a, a letter to the Pope uh, Leo X around 1515, where he described that this is actually the way that a building could be represented. And somehow <clears throat> that system has remained with us for at least 500 years. And it's a gorgeous system for representing space. And, and, uh, but it's also a system that frames our line of thinking, our ways of working. And it has a hard time uh, encompassing time. I think one of my... Uh, co-opponents would address that later on. But when you start framing um, the relationship between architecture and nature, then you go back to Vitruvius, and then at a certain time we get to early Renaissance and, and, and onwards. But all this from the Renaissance onwards r relate to a special value system that goes with one word, and that is harmony. And with the, in the in 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 the late I mean, in the nineties, we start seeing that system being challenged. That suddenly we start to appreciate heterogeneity mm -hmm. in another way. So, could you please elaborate a bit on what you see bringing in that um, those early days? Uh, human nature relationships, nature architecture relationships, because that is sort of one end of a bracket that goes with early Renaissance until more or less today, right? And that is sort of outside. Does that, does that uh, bring in some, uh, some features that can help you in, the, in your investigations on those cases and in those current day uh, interest in what landscape uh, can bring to architecture? Um, Hochele the opponent, thank you very much for this interesting question. Um, actually, it's been a challenge to uh, go, I think, throughout the whole history of architecture. <laughs> and I tried to make that relatively short. And I think um, the, the theories that I work with and the projects that I work with or analyzed, um, they all emerged in the same time. So everything happened around the turn of the century, actually. This, the, these projects got developed, the theories got changed, uh, architecture got certainly uh, challenged a lot. Um, and to look at this very long time frame was uh, sometimes for me as, a, as an architect myself uh, also a bit frightening because I realized suddenly that I'm, uh, uh, the changes that are, were occurring, I think, are much deeper than in the beginning I would have thought. So when I looked at the projects first, I said, well, it's interesting, it's a bit different. But in consequence, if you think it to the end, uh, I, I realized that the changes that these projects do, and that's with architects that are very aware of that history themselves, how 
they, they're very aware of what they're doing, where they're standing in history. Um, uh, the changes are uh, big, and I think that you're right that the harmony was always something uh, that architects were seeking, um, but they were always seeking it within the system of architecture itself. So, which is also natural when you propose to the Pope, because if you agree with the Pope, and the Pope as a representative of God, uh, probably this Pope's architect and the Pope, they could very well establish uh, what the ideal harmony was, but it always rests within the system itself. And I think that the big change is actually the 19th century, where we, where we sort of humans completely changed the view. Uh, I, I discovered halfway through the thesis, uh, Angela Wolf calling it the invention of nature. Um, uh, when Humboldt suddenly discovered the world outside and put it into science. And um, I think this, this had a huge consequence of uh, a completely different uh, role of uh, human and architects uh, towards nature. And um, when I started the thesis, I think this was a kind of maybe a marginal phenomenon. And in these times that I worked on it now, we realize it's, it's actually the crucial question we are now. We're now at the, a real limit as humans, as we understand that we're going to probably destroy our own environment. And architecture has been part of that, and the seeking for harmony within the object and the logic and the technique itself won't, won't be sufficient. So, yeah. um, then again, this is a deeply philosophical question, and I, I still try to remain within the limits and within the tools that I have, and work with the tools as a designer, and try to understand it as a designer develop new ways of drawing uh, that some of these designers developed, but in the end they had to file st standardized uh, documents that are for building permits that are the same documents that since the Renaissance have to be delivered. So uh, Sometimes I even encountered that, for example, of a design uh, like uh, Peter Eisenman's for the City of Culture, there was no existing floor plan of the whole project. There was one top view, but never anybody would. And that's with the project of Peter Eisenman, who was, his whole life he was busy with, you know, gnarly drawings and other sort of complex drawings of the city explained as a whole. <coughs> and um, so I think we, we, we're still in, in the beginning and the mixing of the disciplines, the interaction of the disciplines, <coughs> also like at this university is happening now. Uh, will probably lead to uh, a better way, and I think I might have underestimated the consequences of the things I've opened with my thesis. Mm. And I'm humble enough not to be proposing to, in only a short time of research, rewriting the history of architecture. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is understanding this... this uh, specific time and what is going on and trying to look for how to sort of situate oneself outside of what you are observing, you bring into um, main methodological frameworks, which my second question would address. Um, so on the one hand, you have this four-layer design analysis, uh, which could s is very rooted within the uh, <laughs> formation of architecture that I just uh, uh, described and you try to sort of add on some additional ways of representing um, uh, the various features that you are after in each of the cases and then you have um, the four landscape attitudes. So what I would like you to elaborate a little bit on is <clears throat> how those two uh, systems, one could say, the four-layer uh, analysis and the landscape attitudes, how those systems or value clusters, how do they relate to one another when you start getting into the detail? And, and this goes with some of 
I think it's become very obvious with the um, tables that you have uh, that you have uh, 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 added to your to your thesis. I could ask, how does the program form and the sub urbanistic bottom-up programming relate when, for instance, including the notion of context? How does the image form and the amnesia relate? How does the spatial form and the sequencing relate? As you can hear, I, I imply that there are some relationships, yet the premises uh, differ. So, how how do you see those two systems uh, work in tandem? What do they contribute in in total? Also, would having that uh, reflection on on uh, trying to position yourself at a distance from what you are observing in mind? Hochleerde opponent, thank you for this question. Oh, I will have to switch, but that's okay. That's good makes me a difference uh, for everybody who hasn't had the pleasure to read the thesis yet uh, I, I put it up here quickly the resume the tables that were mentioned um, and uh, this is the analytical table of uh, the four uh, form, formal layers, so the, the model that I took from uh, Steinberger and Ray, with the ground form, the spatial form, and the image form. And you see the three columns, are uh, the three cases, and I, I sort of in detail look for each case in the text, and this is only the summary about how this works. And indeed, there is a certain overlap with uh, the attitudes of Maro and uh, sometimes there's a repetition. So how how did I deal with that? You also have to see that again these are two theories that have been developed developed in the same time. Uh, and initially, uh, I didn't plot that out so clearly in the thesis because everybody around me was working with it. So I didn't even bother to explain it again. But especially through our external peers, I got. Uh, into into a deeper differentiation in the final phase of the thesis and pulled out these tables. Um, it's clearly an overlap, and how do I deal with it? I, I use one of them, the formal analysis, very concretely. It's a, been, it's a concrete uh, drawing technique that uh, the chair of landscape architecture had uh, developed out of other uh, Delft methods for architectural analysis and I use it very concretely. I practiced that a lot. I did, I did actually mm. 40 buildings with students and then again 20 buildings and I, I did it with my colleague uh, Paul Ronke in Wageningen. We tried to blend it over with uh, Wageningen analytical models. So this is a thing uh, I, I did many, many times before I decided how to do it for my thesis, before I decided which are going to be the three only buildings, or maybe sometimes it was more, but in the end it was three, that I'm going to apply it to. And it's I would not, say... It's not so much how you use it, it's more how you think that they actually, what they give to one another, and, and when you can say that they are talking about the same thing, or when they actually are I, I, quite they, different. They, they are talking about the same thing, but one of them is, again, merely talking about it, and the other one is doing it. So I, and I think that is also reasonable. So I, 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 I used it as the introduction, as I talk, with Moreau, talking about landscape architecture. Then I want to get concrete, so I use a real formal analytical tool. And then, again, I try to use Moreau for the critique, to standing yeah. back and becoming, let's say, more philosophical. And also maybe there is different ways of looking at landscapes. So Maro is, is a critic, and he's, he's in a, also a very philosophical landscape school, which is the French landscape school, which is uh, all thesis projects in, in architecture, uh, landscape architecture in France, are a very philosophical project. And uh, another approach is a, it's a very concrete and, and drawing approach, where actually this emerges from a movement in the 70s, where the architects said, enough of this, theories, we want to know what is concrete, so we, let's draw. So 
both have their place, both have their interaction. And I think as a thesis to come to a philosophic theoretical conclusion, I, I needed also to step back in, into pure theory with Moreau. Mm -hmm. And I realized there is a certain overlap, but I think that's like we all have, between what we're doing, what we're thinking, there's, there should be connection. Okay. Are Thank you, you satisfied with the answers? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking part in your position. Meanwhile, Professor Geuze has appeared. Uh, welcome. Professor Geuze is from the University of Wageningen. I ask you, are you already prepared to put your questions? Uh, yes, I am. Good. Then I would like to give you the floor. Um, thank you. Um, dear candidate, uh, it was a pleasure to read this uh, a remarkable crossover in landscape architecture. architecture. Uh, it's somehow deep in your heart uh, and very recognizable and maybe uh, even a sort of shared interest for this interdisciplinary um, uh, field. Um, it is... Um, for me, very, uh, I'm very happy uh, and I feel confident, uh, especially for your, the introduction of Marot's uh, uh, attitudes, which even made uh, the heart of your dissertation. They even became part of the matrix. And I think they are a very uh, relevant tool for analyzing. <coughs> uh, but I have a question as well about uh, the, the subject of landscape, as you might know, understand, and you made many pages about it. Landscape is a very complex thing. You cannot even uh, mention landscape without uh, 30 pages. <laughs> um, and so uh, it, within landscape, there is a sort of risk of over-articulation uh, your uh, three case studies. So you bombard them with a very complex thing. Now, now come now here my question. In, um, so you walk over the world of nature as sort of not not good enough uh, for for this landscape should be better so but somewhere there's the, the field of uh, geology uh, which is an interesting which introduces uh, uh, geology has a sort of domain of uh, the science of tectonics and tectonics are deep forces uh, in in the earth in the in the plasma uh, who cause uh, gravity and magnetic fields and ruptures uh, on the surface. And uh, in uh, geology, uh, there's a lot of phenomena uh, described, uh, such as continental shelves, which are floating, folding, um, curving, rippling. Um, the, the landscape, uh, visible landscape, is uh, banded, uh, cracked, broken. Uh, there is uh, sculpting, lifting, compressing. Uh, and, uh, and layers uh, in the in the fluvial uh, geology. There, there's also the introduction of the solid and the fluid nature, and and, uh, and stone, meandering valleys. Um, there's holes, caves, and sinks. Everything. So my question is: Would geology not be a better tool for analyzing your case studies than landscape? The phenomena of geology uh, seem so very well suited for your case studies. Hochelehrer opponent, thank you very much for these questions. Uh, I briefly studied uh, a bit of geology in my thesis. I touched upon it, but it's true that it could have become uh, a very a deep uh, study. Um, one of the first interesting things I learned at this university, not even in my faculty, but at this university in my first PhD course, is that the theory of continental drift wasn't accepted as a scientific theory until the 1970s. So we had to guess all together, when do you think the theory of continental drift was accepted, acceptable as, for example, your PhD subject? And until the 1960s, you couldn't couldn't defend the thesis that would say continental drift is the cause. It's incredible, no? If you think what geology is today. So any science, even geology, is so extremely young in understanding. And in consequence, what would that mean? That architects, 
when they were thinking about, if they were thinking about the landscape, because they rarely were, maybe Frank Lloyd Wright was in the modern times, they could think of it like that, <coughs> like we think of it today. So, um, I mean, an accepted theory in geology was always the layering of the times, the disruption of laying of times, but the really big forces on the continental scale um, weren't accepted until the end. And there's two father and son professors that made their careers in Zurich, again, at the ETH, as geology professors, that had a completely different explanation for the landscape, which is just behind my house in the Alps, uh, in the Elm Valley. And that uh, theory would exclude also that the, what was actually happening is actually the main movement coming from Ac Africa, coming over Europe, which is happening right there, and we can see it when we walk through the landscape. Um, so I, I could have, uh, of course, I think I think, uh, could have had a deeper look into geology, but I think it might not have been fair even to criticize. But I think it's one of the typical elements of that we that we only very recently actually understand nature, and we had that is maybe a typical example that all our concepts uh, of nature through history uh, are very artificial, and maybe that's also where many things went wrong, especially in a discipline like architecture, that always uh, was about the supremacy in, or of humans across nature and without even understanding it. Um, so I think, yes, you're perfectly right, and uh, uh, we, should, we should study it more. And uh, I remember a very memorable moment, you guiding me through the soil collection of Wageningen University, and I wish we would come back there and have a deeper understanding of it, but it's not what I did, uh, I think, in my research. Professor Geus, are you satisfied with the answer? Um, half. Um, <laughs> if I could uh, make a small, uh, let's say, small effort. The, the, I, I, can you, uh, could you uh, possibly make a sort of reflection on the... Um, uh, the words I just mentioned, uh, wouldn't they be very applicable for your matrix uh, instead of all these architecture words, landscape architecture uh, phenomena and attitudes? Especially the yes. folding yes. In, uh, in, in, the, in your matrix could have... Yes. I think they are, they are uh, uh, extremely applicable and they, they also... Um, sorry. I just go out of this. Not to. Um, no, they, they are definitely uh, very applicable. Though this geological form, the folding was a big subject in the in the 1990s. The um, the, the notion of of time and a different notion of time. The create Eisenman talks a lot about. Uh, also, he, he's sort of bursting the, 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 the stupidity of the idea that architecture could be uh, a timeless thing, you know. And he says, no, we, we, we are working with time. And he is, he is working a lot with time. On the other side, also, my, his, his project is unfinished and it's completely unaware of what he is doing as an architect because he still defends it as an autonomous discipline and... Uh, I think this this uh, understanding of, uh, of geological time, of understanding our own presence as humankind, limited or on on this earth, it is is very contrary. So I, I started to become very uh, rebellious also with these studies in, in inside architecture, and I went to Peter and I had to go out of his office alive. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would would have loved to to have that fight, but also I realized that there there are some still some real uh, 
crunch lines if you in in this and uh, things that that will have to be solved in the future and I I would be very glad to have you as an ally when uh, I see my fellow architects uh, to uh, go deeper in that discussion I think so Geuze, can you consider this to be sufficiently answered yes thank you thank you very much for taking part in your position that you were could make it this morning thanks a lot and I would like to proceed and give the floor to the next opponent professor Nijssen okay where the promoter is I have to congratulate you with the courage to take uh, such an ambitious project, eh? landscape strategies and architecture. Basically, that's the whole earth. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we cannot expect that in this, uh, although it's a rather big uh, booklet, everything is treated uh, perfectly. Eh? My uh, fellow uh, committee leader also pointed that out. Yeah. But I would like to emphasize uh, on something which I think is very important to humans, and, and that's real nature. And my first question is about a tendency you see in nowadays architecture to integrate nature in it. Not only a plant on your balcony, but even, eh, I've been lucky to participate in the development of the uh, Expo 2000 uh, Pavilion of MVRDV, where they have a real forest on the, f on the third floor. How do you see this development uh, uh, in your strategies? Hoogeleerde opponent, thank you very much uh, for this question. Uh, indeed, I remember the Expo 2000 Pavilion. I went there myself. Um, and uh, as you know also, the architects of the uh, Expo 2000 Pavilion, uh, the Dutch MBR de Weaver, two of them were actually working on this project before they founded their own office. So there's a direct link uh, through their work and um, I think it's very I mean this is already now 20 years ago that they designed that uh, and was at the time very visionary and I think nowadays it's almost becoming a common place so there's this summer there's a lecture series in Amsterdam about architecture and half of the architecture is working with some kind of landscape on nature. Um, I still uh, have my reservations also on, for example, this build, a building like uh, the Expo Pavilion, although I welcome it as uh, a very uh, widely uh, accepted uh, approach to architecture. Meanwhile, I think um, I miss actually, and I miss them also in these projects I analyzed, a deeper understanding of, of nature. Uh, I, I got through that in the research, and I realized also that in order to close the research, I have to stop at this critique and take it as it is. Uh, I would like to find out, because meanwhile, there's so much of these products uh, for future research, I would really like to go into what is actually the natural value, what is the ecological value of these buildings. So how good is a forest in the city? Is it really a forest? Is that Bosco Verticale, or this recently one opened just last week in Switzerland, the uh, high-rise building where my colleague uh, Oikster has been designing a forest on the balconies. Is that really the value of a real forest and what is the accessible ecological value. Um, and for example, when I walk with an ecologist through my own projects now as a landscape architect, I realize that I look already as a landscape architect, because I'm an architect, I'm looking very differently at the tree than she does. Because she says, oh no, this tree, you can have it because it only has 200 species, but this tree I want to keep because it has 3,000 species. And I never looked at it like that. I only think about my own species. I only think about if I like it. So um, I'm, I think there's a lot of research going to be done and in this field. We're only at the beginning. So we're only at the, the ideas. The ideas have changed. 
we know that already, but the techniques, um, for example, at a tec technological university like this, we should study the techniques. Uh, the deeper understanding of how nature works hasn't really infiltrated our engineering yet. We can work with the imagery very well already, uh, but there's going to be a lot of work, I think, into a deep understanding of nature. But don't you think it's the other way around? Eh? We started as human beings on the earth, carving our way in a forest, <coughs> in a jungle, eh, where we could live, where we could have... Uh, uh, agriculture and then and, uh, and, and use cattle. Yeah, so we carved our places out and now we're at a stadium in which is the opposite. Yeah? Nature is in danger. Yeah, so how can we protect that in a landscape strategy? Yeah? How do you protect real life, real wildlife? We have now the wolf coming back in the Netherlands. Yeah, if I point out to tigers in India or lions in Africa, how can they survive in our modern world, crowded with uh, three million, four million, uh, milliard uh, people? Uh, mm -hmm. Billion, sorry, yeah, that's the right word. Yeah. How do you look into that? What's, what's their rights? What, are, what would you have for obligations against them? I think we have them, and I think we will... Uh I, I read uh, a couple of weeks ago that the experts say that uh, population growth is going to level at maybe 10, between eight, between nine and 10 billion, maybe between 2070 and yeah, the end knows, of yeah. 21, knows, yeah. uh, which means that we, we still have maybe the chance and time to develop the right approach to find uh, a level. But on the other hand, uh, everything is falling down around us. So, no, I, I see it as my own obligation in my own projects to be working deeper. I saw, saw it as my obligation also to point the finger on where I think these projects don't do it yet. And um, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge that we're going to have to take in education and that we're going to have to take in our own uh, workings. And... Um, mm. I, I hope I can, uh, uh, I, I kind of gave a basis to a small aspect of it, but I'm not going to solve it myself. But uh, I'm sure fighting <coughs> with you. And I'm uh, happy to know that there is also on, on the constructive and engineering side of our profession, uh, people that want to fight with that. Basically, this is the same issue we were just talking about. Eh? Shouldn't it be opposite? Eh? That landscape should be uh, fitting into nature, or uh, let na nature fit, real nature, I mean, fit into the landscape. Eh? How do we give back that? I think that's a very important starting point for a sustainable future, that we really turn that around. Eh? And we are good engineers, we have beautiful computers, we have artificial and intelligent with that should be used to create real nature and that sounds very strange like you can create real nature but real nature always exists if you have the algae on your wall it's nature if you have a little space where a little earth is going in nature will grow there rats infiltrate our buildings so nature is already doing that but how do we keep that under control in control i mean for both sides, both nature and humankind. Do you have any ideas about that? Hochleer opponent, thank you very much for this question and referring to this uh, uh, proposition, which is very important to me. Um, I uh, developed, uh, or I took also from others, the idea that uh, landscape is actually the way we conceptualize nature in our history, so it's actually the, uh, as uh, Bas and Brock called it, humane aesthetical appropriation of nature. And uh, we need thoughts and intellectual constructs to understand the world. And it's been uh, not always very easy to teach landscape concepts to architects, for example, for example, at this faculty, or to, um, to have this kind of 
holistic understanding of the world does, but also that you intervene in it. And I think also it's not a coincidence that some of these concepts actually emerged from the Netherlands, where we realized, maybe only in the 1970s, that we were actually making, we could be making nature again. So we could actually make a, a primary forest and it could grow in only 20 years and we could establish an ecosystem uh, that, as Franz Vera said, when he studied the Ostfalus Plus, and that this was probably the, how the Netherlands looked 10,000 years ago, and we developed it only in 20 years. Um, I've had my own experiences as a landscape designer of coming with such proposals of creating new nature into my homely Switzerland, where this was by law forbidden. You cannot create a nature reserve. A nature reserve is always a reserve. There's always something which has to be nature before and then reserve it, and then you're not allowed to do anything as an architect or landscape architect. This is nature. And this kind of thinking that we actually are the custodians and we have to sort of, as designers, to create it has, is very young and still fragile and something we need to defend a lot. Nice. are you satisfied with this answer? Yes, I am, Mr. Director. Thanks a lot for your contribution. We would like to proceed to give the floor to Professor Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Director. Um, dear uh, Promovendus, um, I have to thank you for your very interesting uh, thesis, which I read with pleasure, and especially the three projects, the three case studies, they gave a lot of information about these projects I didn't know yet. Um, but reading especially the, the, these three case studies, I got also more and more amazed about the fact that uh, so little attention has been paid to what I think is one of the most crucial differences between landscapes or natural landscapes and buildings, which is um, but a landscape is, 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 by definition, a dynamic entity. And uh, these buildings, also in the way they are described by their, and explained by their designers, they are uh, meant to be static elements. And that's, for instance, especially in the Jusieu project by OMA in Paris, it's a huge project covering a big part of the city, but which is basically intended to be maintained as it is designed forever. Um, and I was wondering, why do you pay so, uh, so, so just a few attention to the factor time? You, there is one or one and a half page where you pay attention to landscape theories, in the, like the, the, the uh, Ein Magark and, and uh, in Wageningen, Meet of Rome, and also one of your supervisors, Professor Simons, paid a lot of attention to the difference between different dynamics in, in, in landscape and that you should take into account in these differences. And then talking about the buildings and with your intention to introduce landscape methods in buildings, it's, there is no, not any word in, anymore about time and how, mm -hmm. and about the potential dynamic character of perhaps parts or uh, layers in these buildings. So, uh, how come? Hochleerde opponent, thank you very much for this interesting question. Um, I've, I encountered the problem of time a lot, I think. I don't think uh, uh, I haven't written about it. Um, I have looked at uh, the cases, how they are, and I would think in the Jussier case, um, maybe it's, it's, it's the non-realized project, so it's the one we, we can... Uh, the least look at, but when, when I dove into it and I sort of started to visualize how it would have looked and started to understand how the architects uh, wanted to program 
the building, also visiting uh, later projects which are found on sim similar uh, principles. Um, I think the aspect of time has been uh, in this project uh, maybe even more uh, considered than in the last project I looked at, which is very paradoxical, because Peter Eisman talks about time all the time. Uh, but if you look at the building, he's completely not aware of what he's doing it. He's trying to do, again, a timeless masterpiece. And uh, actually, uh, by the end of his career, he's talking about the end of his life and things about late architecture and things like that. So there, there is something... There's something weird going on in the head of architects about time. And I think the idea of timelessness as in, as, uh, that modernism came up with maybe 100 years ago, that, that architecture should be perfect for all times, uh, has really ruined uh, our ability, and I very much critique that actually in the end, to understand how limited we actually are in our existence, and especially <coughs> architects. How we should not focus on just at the time of delivering a building. How we, not, we should understand where we come from in history. Maybe in the 70s there was a sort of broader understanding that I'm only putting a little piece into the city but as if, an architect, if, if but we're not doing you, it enough. Yes. If, if I may interrupt you, isn't you now especially focus on the architects and what they say about the buildings, but is it also not included in the method you apply yourself? That, uh, the, the, the method which you, uh, let's say, borrow from Steenberg and Ray is a method which distinguishes different layers, but also in these different layers, the factor time is not included. And so is it perhaps also related to your own methodology, the way how you look to the projects, that this aspect time is not really represented in your analysis? Um, thank you very much for uh, this precision. Um, Yes, I think uh, you're right that the, the method of uh, Steinberg and Ray is in a way uh, limited to a sort of analytical moment that doesn't really consider the processes of transformation enough. Um, I think I, in the conclusion, I talk a lot about that where I see the big lackings uh, in architecture and where I see the big chances when I with implementing landscape um, design strategies is actually in being more aware about our timeliness as architects. And um, <coughs> uh, I think uh, Marot is touching much more on this when he talks about processes when uh, he, he's much more aware of that, and he's much more aware also about what any landscape designer does. He's much more aware about the different timescales we have to work with. And I think it is crucial, actually, um, that this basic understanding of is, is coming into architectural and urban planners' education. So I was very proud when at the faculty uh, actually by move of an external commission, if I remember right, they said, no, no, you cannot teach landscape as a specialization. It has to be the basis of any architectural education. Yes, aren't we very proud of having that, of having the, the understanding of our existence in the whole surroundings understood as a landscape, understood as a process. It should be the basis of anybody who is creating something and... A colleague of mine draw a children's book about how animals uh, build their own houses, and I think it's, it's a, a genius idea. He's an urban planner and an architect. Uh, we should be really aware about what we're doing, what resources we're using, and um, this is going to be a big challenge, but uh, I hope I can contribute to that. Mayor. 
Do you consider this as an answer to your question? Yes, I have a second question, but I leave it to you if I'm allowed to. Put I think we have also to give the promoters a little bit of time. Thanks a lot for your contribution. I would like to proceed to give the floor to the co-promoter, Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, can you keep your, uh, your question a little bit short? Yes, it's a very so simple you, question. You could. Um, these two propositions seem uh, rather contradictory to one another, but to, uh, to make it simple, architecture has always been about the, the, the definition of borders, definition of demarcation, where we stay, sleep, eat, where everything else is. So if I were to look at this, then you're proposing that somehow, it seems you're pro proposing that that line should diminish or blurred, be blurred. So that is number one. And number two, if that is not, uh, 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 that is definitely a human-centric position. This is what, what we need. And uh, uh, on the other hand, in Proposition 6, you seem to uh, um, ask for less human-centric approach to architecture, right? So it seems to me that all the problems we have now, we got into because we have developed human-centric position, our point of view, which is fine. But then again, how can you reconcile these two things? Number one, you need to include architecture or incorporate architecture into nature, but at the same time, we need to do it in a human-centric way. So. Just as your answer, how do you see that demarcation becoming different? Thank you very much. Uh, for your question. Um, I think actually in the essence is rather in the seventh proposition. Uh, maybe the sentence should be turned around. So I, I say... I shouldn't, we shouldn't be defining architecture as the opposite of nature anymore. Uh, <coughs> and um, from a human perspective, we should understand that we are aesthetically appropriation nature with landscape. Um, and that's only a part of it. Uh, that's not all we're doing. Um, so... Uh, I think it is uh, still the cases I looked at, they're still very limited in, especially the, the last case I looked at, is actually defending still the autonomy of architecture, actually denying that an architect should be, Peter Eisen was denying, you can read it in the interviews, that an architect should even be caring about landscape or nature. Uh, so I very much encountered that opposition there. And um, I think uh, I, I took my own uh, consequences out of it and sort of dared to criticize maybe the one of the founders of contemporary architecture theory uh, <laughs> in my own position. Um, so yes, there is, there's going to be discussion. It's not an easy thing that I can, as a young uh, from vendors, sort of state that everything should be different than the founders of a discipline uh, and established uh, people uh, stated now. So maybe these are uh, not formulated as strict as they should be, these propositions, because I still try to survive in this context of architectural theory. Dr. Lee, do you want to let him survive? Uh, yes, <laughs> I will. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your contribution. I would like to give the floor to Professor Riedijk. Thank you, Mr. Director. Waarde promovendus, as you probably might remember, during our research trajectory, we have been discussing extensively how to understand or define PhD researches in general. First of all, we have to identify a lack within current discourse or the known body of knowledge. After all, without a proper understanding of this hiatus, there's no reason to start any research at all. 
after acknowledging this, we have to define an approach, a methodology, in order to investigate this lack within the discourse. Finally, of course, we have to provide a reasoning to overcome the identified hiatus and to contribute to the body of knowledge within our discipline. So it coincides with gathering facts, organizing facts, and of course, interpreting facts. Your research has always profoundly puzzled me, and I will try to translate my feelings of bewilderment into the following two questions. Could you briefly explain to me what the lack within current discourse is addressed with your research? And secondly, what hiatuses are covered with your results and how do they contribute to the known body of knowledge within our discipline? So that's the first question. The second question, I'll address it immediately. Besides that, taking into account that collecting facts is of primary importance to substantiate a lack within current discourse, are three, th three case studies enough to claim that landscape strategies are applicable in architecture. Hochachte Promoter, thank you very much for these questions. Uh, indeed, we had an uh, intense interaction about the methodology of my thesis. I'm very grateful for uh, you having asked me to do this uh, synopsis. Uh, which uh, guided me and in, into structuring, and I hope it might help now to also uh, address your question. I think you're uh, pointing to what is actually the gap that I found, what, what did I identify, and my limitation to only uh, three cases was actually out of a will to be able to go much deeper than everything I had studied about this subject before. So, yeah, sorry that I intervene, but you're drifting away. So f let's first address the gap that is identified by you and addressed by you. So the gap I identified is, is there a real understanding of what landscape actually is uh, in these emerging architecture theories and with the architects that work with these theories or try to create something? Is that really true? Because there's also a kind of longing to save the profession implicitly or explicitly throughout the dissertation? Um, I think you might be referring to uh, an article I wrote uh, in the book of uh, Dr. Lee, uh, where I indeed thought that if architecture wouldn't address uh, the question of sustainability, and I think with this this is one of the approaches, how to approach it, it would perish as a discipline, so it wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, it would become irrelevant. So this happens already now, that uh, we architects, we sort of lose our hands on our own doings. Thank you, Madam Beadle. May I invite the promo offenders and the parnims to take their seat in the room again. Ladies and gentlemen, the committee will withdraw for further deliberation in the committee room. The session is adjourned. I reopen the session and request the promo vendors and the par names to come in front of the committee. Het college voor promoties van de Technische Universiteit Delft, vertegenwoordigd door de hier aanwezige commissie, heeft na kennis genomen te hebben van uw proefschrift met stellingen en na uw verdedigingen daarvan te hebben gehoord, met in achtneming van de bepaalde in de wet op het hoger onderwijs en het wetenschappelijk onderzoek, besloten u de graad te verlenen van dokter. Ik verzoek de promotor door het college voor promoties als u daar nog daartoe aangewezen, zich wel van hem opgedragen taak te kwijten. Dank u meneer de rector. Uit kracht van de bevoegdheid bij wet toegekend aan het college voor promoties, verklaar ik namens dat college, hier vertegenwoordigd door de rector Magnificus en de overige leden, 
van de commissie. Bij u, uh, bij deze u, uh, Daniel, Theobald, Jocelyn, te bevorderen tot dokter en u uh, alle rechten te verlenen welke aan de dokterstitel uh, zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u het diploma dat u het recht geeft de titel dokter te voeren. Het is ondertekend door de rector Magnificus en de promotoren en voorzien van het zegel van de Technische Universiteit Delft. It is the promoter's privilege to be the first to congratulate the young doctor. Professor Simons, the floor is yours. Thank you. you may stand up. I may stand up. Well, that's good. <laughs> Esteemed Dr. Jocelyn, dear Daniel, here we are. We find, we, we find ourselves at the end of what we all feel as the twinning between a marathon and a very bumpy ride. Uh, But you just crossed the finish line. Uh, after some, I think, 48 versions of your thesis and the round of congratulations uh, next hour, you will be allowed to enter the oxygen tent to retrieve your breath, or in your case, your writer's hut, that, as you never fail to inform us uh, as your promoter team, is at uh, 2157 meters of altitude. You are the last of the PhD candidates that were left like uh, academic orphans when my predecessor abruptly decided to stop guiding all PhD trajectories. And all of you wanted to pursue their fascination and study it through the lens of the Delft method, uh, with its ground form layer, its space form layer, its metaphorical form, and finally its program form. It was a shock, of course, but looking back, I think it proof, proved to be a sort of liberation, and all of the members of the group sort of criticized the Delft method, added to it, changed it, and in the end enriched it. And in your case, Daniel, you decided wisely to mix a cocktail between the Delft four-layer model and also four, four attitudes in landscape design as constructed by Sebastien Marot. Anamnesis, process, spatial sequencing and context. A cocktail, shaken, not stirred, that allowed you to, make, to take a fresh look at architecture with landscape methods. And this was, to my mind, very meaningful, a twinning between your initial discipline as an architect and your new chosen discipline as a landscape architect. One of the reasons you choose to be critical on building architecture and side up with the softer power of landscape architecture was because you felt that the way architects theorize over architecture wouldn't clear the way to make a contribution in uh, solving the environmental conundrum we are, we found ourselves in. And observing that some landscape architects design buildings as landscape lifted you up to your object of PhD research. And the first hurdle to take was to determine what the potential of architecture could be facing these problems. Coming from a rather self-assured modernist position, we are, as a profession much more modest now. And Herman Czech in the 70s of the last century came to the sobering conclusion that architecture is not life itself. Architecture is background. Everything else is not architecture. Architecture won't solve our political, our social, not even our environmental problems, just like music will not solve our noise pollution problems. A quote that could have been stated by Peter Eisenman in the interview you had with him when he chased you out of the office. So the first question to answer was, isn't is this all overreaching what architecture can do or 
Can landscape methods inject enough music in architecture to solve the environmental problems? The second barrier you had to cross was the grandstanding when it comes to architects theorizing about their own work. You must never believe what architects say about their building. That is what Michiel uh, repeatedly said. It's not a very solid scientific basis. You use the Delft four-layer uh, model as an X-ray and the four attitudes of Moreau as an MRI uh, scan to detect the use of landscape methods in their designs, even if they pertinently denied having used it in the case of Peter Eisenman, or in the case of OMA, where the building never got built, or to lower the language barrier when it came to communicating about SANA's Rolex Learning Center. Well, the fact that you stand here proves that you somehow managed to pull this off. It has been a special pleasure to experience your adventures together the second promoter, Michiel Redijk, and co-promoter, Sang Lee. Uh, all we could do was hand you a working compass every once in a while. Daniel, a lot of success in your further career, be it as an architect, <coughs> be it as a landscape architect, be it as an academic career, be it in Ju uh, Zurich, in Holland, or in Paris, or elsewhere. We will follow it with great interest. Thank you. Learned Dr. Yauslin, you now have the right to use the title of doctor. And your doctorate means that society can rely on your judgment that you will act transparently and communicate independently about your results and the societal relevance of your work. In other words, your doctorate implies that you will uphold scientific integrity. I wish you a great deal of wisdom and prosperity with your new status. And on behalf of the Board for Doctorates of the TU Delft, I would like to congratulate you and also your paronyms and family, friends, and all the supporters here in the audience. Dear Dr. Jauslin and your paronyms, may I invite you to go back to your seat in the room. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of this academic ceremony. We have very much appreciated you being here witnessing this all, and having said that, I close this session. <laughs>